Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Zients. I lead the Economic Development Incentives Practice at the Voorhees Law Firm. We're honored to have you here for our sixth annual Economic Development Incentives Conference, what's become the largest annual Economic Development Incentives Conference in the country. Last year, we hosted more than 300 of you in person. Next year, we're looking forward to hosting you in person again. And this year, we're making the best of it by having a virtual seminar and great speakers uh, and, and attendees. So thank you very much for joining us. We provide free continuing education as part of this uh, conference. All we ask of you is you please take a moment to complete the survey and give us your ideas for next year so we can uh, make sure we serve you with ideas of interest. I don't have anything further. I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Chris Knezovic, to lead this panel. It's yours, Chris. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Knezovic. I'm an attorney at Voorhees. I work with Scott in the Economic Development Group. Um, so during this session today, uh, we will cover how Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia are attracting uh, petrochemical, uh, petrochemical downstream and in-use manufacturing companies and businesses that support those operations to the Ohio PA and West Virginia kind of tri-state region. Uh, we have lots to get through during the session, so I'll do a quick intro of our panelists and then we'll get right into it. So today I'm joined by Matt Sibolsky, who's Managing Director of Energy and Petrochemicals uh, for Jobs Ohio. Um, Matt joined Jobs Ohio in 2011 and has held various positions during his time there, including uh, Director of Project Management and Director of Energy and Chemicals. Uh, prior to that, he's held you know, various economic development roles during his career. Uh, he's from Steubenville, Ohio, so so uh, very close, a part of this region that we'll be discussing today, and earned his uh, bachelor's degree in poli sci and his master's in public administration from West Virginia University. Um, almost, I'm also uh, joined by James Aury, um, who is um, he serves as manager of business development uh, for the West Virginia Development Office, which is a division of the state's De Department of Commerce. Uh, he works in business attraction across multiple industries, but focuses mostly on the energy sector, uh, as well as chemical and polymer processing and downstream manufacturing operations. So over the past year, he has assisted uh, the efforts of the governor's downstream jobs task force as well. So James is based in Charleston, West Virginia, and holds an MBA and a degree in economics from uh, West Virginia Wesleyan College. So finally, uh, I'm joined by Brent Vernon, uh, so Brent is executive director of Pennsylvania's Governor's Action Team, which is the Commonwealth's lead state economic development office. Uh, Brent has over 30 years of professional experience, in, uh, experience serving in state and federal economic uh, and workforce development positions. So prior to becoming uh, the uh, Governor Action Team's uh, executive director back in 2015, uh, he held positions of Deputy Director for Project Management and Senior Project Manager. Uh, Brett holds a BA in Poli Sci from Penn State and an MPA from Shippensburg University uh, of Pennsylvania. So we'll go, um, here's just a quick rundown on the agenda. Um, we will, I'll give a quick overview on the tri-state region and the petro petrochemical industry, where things stand. I'll turn it over to Matt to discuss uh, an overview on Ohio and turn it to Brent uh, for uh, Pennsylvania and then James for West Virginia. Each of the three will, will give an overview of how uh, their own state is handling uh, recruiting and attractment uh, of companies and businesses in this industry. We'll have a panel discussion where uh, we'll, we'll talk about a few different topics and then at the end, we'll, uh, we'll also take questions uh, from the group, so please feel free to submit questions throughout this, this session, and hopefully we'll get to uh, some, if not all of them, at the end. Okay, so I'd like to set the stage by, by giving a brief overview of the petrochemical industry uh, in this tri-state region and why it is growing and thriving there. So Ohio, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania sit atop the Marcella Shale which is the biggest natural gas formation in the country. So along with the Utica Shale, which also, uh, you know, which also this region sits on top of, uh, those shales produce a vast amount of natural gas liquids or NGLs, which is a class of drilling byproducts 
like ethane and propane that are used to make plastics and chemicals. So in addition to these vast amounts of natural resources here, a lot of the other pieces line up to make this region an ideal location for growth in the petrochem petrochemical downstream industry, including proximity to end use markets. Uh, there's a good existing infrastructure. Uh, there's a skilled workforce uh, that the industry can pull from. And there's also uh, an established uh, plastics manufacturing industry that they'll I have a little uh, slide on uh, in a minute here. So this chart that we're looking at compares the amount of natural gas produced in Ohio, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia to the rest of the country. And as you can see, the production in these three states is far outpacing uh, you know, the rest of the country. And to put that in context, if you look at the tri-state region's gas production and compare it to the rest of the world, it would actually rank third behind the U.S. and Russia. You know, I mentioned uh, in the opening here about the proximity to end-use markets earlier, and this graphic does a nice job of showing that 80% of the polyethylene demand in the country is, with, is within 700 miles of this tri-state region. And similarly, 70% of the country's polypropylene demand is within 700 miles of the three states. I mentioned the, the existing you know, manufacturing base, and this gives a pretty good indication of just how robust it is. Um, this slide here shows you know, this tri-state region, the existing manufacturing in the area, and how it surrounds uh, the shell cracker facility site, as well as the proposed PTT GC cracker site, uh, both of which we'll, we'll learn a little bit mo more about here shortly. So with that background, I'm going to turn over to Matt uh, so that he can uh, discuss uh, Ohio and its role in uh, securing petrochemical operations. So Matt, take it away. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everybody. Some of the key items I'm going to touch on a brief Jobs Ohio overview, and then uh, provide some insight on some of the key themes that we focus on when we're working on petrochemical projects, and then wrap up with a couple of case studies. So very briefly, Jobs Ohio is the state's private economic development organization. We've been around for 10 years. When Governor Kasich took office, office in January of 2011, he wanted to privatize economic development in Ohio, bring people from various industry sectors that we focus on, 10 of those uh, sector focus uh, silos that we focus on now, bring people from industry to run those sectors. And our sole mission is economic development. So helping companies expand in Ohio and then locate new opportunities. Uh, given that we're a private company, we have a board of directors. Uh, this is a list of them. They're all uh, executives within companies that are located or headquartered in Ohio. And J.P. Nassif, second row towards the right there, is our president and CEO. He's been in that position. It'll be two years next March, or in March next month. So we were privatized in 2011. And then in 2013, we uh, privatized our... Uh, liquor franchise. So we entered into a 25-year lease with the State Department of Commerce where we pur purchased that liquor franchise for about $1.8 billion. And uh, we paid back about $1.4 billion to the state through that bond sale. And then that allows us to operate and use profits from the state, uh, from the sales of liquor within the state of Ohio to operate on a, on an annual basis. And this is a very unique funding model, and uh, it allows us uh, to avoid getting money from the state budget. So uh, we are not beholden to an administration that either favors or doesn't favor economic development. We're, we're kind of isolated from that. And this gives us about $200 million to operate on an annual basis. And given that we're private, we've been able to create our own policy guidelines. We're heavily audited. Uh, multiple times a year, but we do have our own policy uh, guidelines around programs. So it gives us some flexibility on how we can use our funds. And this structure is really critical to our success 
and I'll provide some examples of that related to the PTT project uh, here in a bit. We have uh, over 100 employees here at Jobs Ohio, and then we have six regional partners, and uh, we have con consultants that operate in 10 international markets. The majority of our 111 full-time equivalents in our office in Columbus are a uh, heavy concentration of back office because of our liquor franchise ownership. We're kind of uh, we kind of operate as a billion dollar company when you look at the revenue. So we have significant uh, amount of back up office operations. And on the economic development side, we have about 10 project managers and then uh, the 10 sectors. So we're pretty lean. So we rely heavily on our regional partners and our local partners throughout the state. Uh, since 2011, this does not include our 2020 numbers as they're still being finalized, but we've won over 2,500 projects, about $57 billion in capital investment, almost $10 billion in new payroll, and about 200,000 new jobs. And these metrics are commitments that companies provide to us when we provide them incentives to a project. So if we provide in incentives to a project, then the company commits to certain metrics and then they sign agreements either with us or with the state of Ohio if it's a state tax credit, which we negotiate on behalf of the state. These metrics also include projects that we may not have financially supported, but we help them in some other way. So we got them through a regulatory process. We found them real estate. We did some other, uh, played some other critical role in landing their investment in Ohio. Chris touched on uh, kind of the different graphic here, but um, we've seen since 2008-ish, I, I won't speak for Brent, but Ohio uh, benefited from kind of being the last in the shale development cycle. So we saw things that were happening in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, and it allowed our, our Department of Natural Resources, Ohio EPA, to learn from the other states and get ready for the shale development that really started taking off in Ohio in 2010 and then in earnest in 2011. Uh, about five, six years ago, Jobs Ohio entered into a stream, midstream and downstream investment in Ohio. And uh, we, we published those numbers either semi-annually or annually. And from 2010 to 2019, We've seen 86.4 billion, so about 60 billion is upstream. So the actual exploration and production of wells, 20.2 uh, billion is in midstream. So a lot of pipelines and uh, processing plants. When gas comes out of our wells, especially in Ohio, we have a lot of wet gas. So it's natural gas, ethane, propane, and butane. butane. So those uh, gases and liquids need to be separated out. So that happens at processing plants. And then we've seen about $6.2 billion in downstream investment. Right now, that is has primarily been natural gas-fired power plants, but we're working towards attracting more downstream chemical uh, users, such as the PTT cracker. And then we also have a significant downstream chemical industry that we're working with so that they can hopefully expand in Ohio by taking advantage of kind of this newly formed, fully integrated system. This is a map. It's a bit hard to read on this slide, but it's on our website. If you visit jobsohio.com and go to the energy and chemicals sector tab, but this just shows kind of that fully integrated um, mix. The red is kind of the mid midstream facilities. The small black uh, dots and squares are meant to depict 25 active wells. You see the pipelines, the dark blue are uh, a portion of our chemicals industry and uh, things of that nature. So we really do have a fully integrated system and it's really been built out that midstream, upstream and midstream over the last 10 years. So some key themes on petrochemical projects, site identification uh, for petrochemical projects while the type of project will determine the size and the type of infrastructure needed. We rely heavily on a comprehensive site database that we manage throughout Ohio with our local and regional partners. But we really try to find sites that require the least amount of infrastructure or other costs that would need to be incurred to, to develop. 
So um, we could find a site that might work, but it would need $30, $40 million of infrastructure upgrades. Clients don't want to pay for that, and we don't want to get stuck with the bill for every project that we work on. So we really try to be very selective in our sites, know as much as we can about sites, so uh, both large and, and small, so that we can put the, the right ones in front of uh, clients. So we, we really try to understand what project needs uh, are there. An ethane cracker is very has very different needs than say a smaller gas to methanol plant. So, and I'll provide a comparison there uh, later on. We also have worked with uh, the, our friends at, in Pennsylvania and West Virginia on understanding regional assets. So for instance, on the ethane cracker side, MPLX, which is the midstream company for Marathon, uh, operates processing plants throughout Southwest Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And uh, it, that allows for significant redundancy for an ethane cracker type project. So understanding that is, is important as well as underground storage, which has uh, been looking at all three uh, states to help store natural gas liquids such as ethane. Also work very closely on regulatory assistance while Jobs Ohio is not a state agency, we work very closely with Ohio EPA, DNR, et cetera, Army Corps of Engineers to, in order to get projects through the regulatory process very quickly. We've also mobilized support for public hearings. Uh, so make sure that you know labor comes out in support of uh, projects when they're going through the public hearing process. And in fact, the Falcon pipeline, which is an ethane pipeline that comes out of Harrison County, Ohio, and it will feed the ethane primary line to feed the shell cracker in Manaka, Pennsylvania. There were public hearings that were held in Ohio about the pipeline, and we helped uh, make sure that uh, we had support out there because while the cracker is in Pennsylvania, we see the importance of it to the region. So we were happy to do that. And then quickly, incentive package development our funding stream allows us to target grant or loan funds uh, specifically to project needs. So it gives us a lot of uh, a flexibility. And while we're very f well funded, we do take an ROI approach to every project. So we try to understand what type of economic benefit a project would have to the state and make sure that we're not providing offers that would make us underwater. And then we also have the ability to tap into state incentive programs like tax credits and infrastructure grants. Uh, and then one big distinction, we do not directly incentivize startups, early stage companies or pre-revenue companies because of the risk associated with those projects. Very briefly, case study uh, for the PTT Cracker project, it's in excess of $8 billion, would be five to 6,000 construction jobs, about 500 operational jobs, and uh, they needed 500 acres on it on the Ohio River with rail and heavy power. So we found uh, the site that we pitched to Shell that ultimately ended up going to Manaka, Pennsylvania. And over the years, Jobs Ohio spent about $70 million in site prep and engineering work to help get the site uh, cleared up. There was a power plant that was shuttered on the on the property, on the north end of the property. So we did all that due to our flexibility uh, with the Jobs Ohio funding so that when the PTT project does go to a final investment decision, they can uh, construct quickly. And then a small case study, Alpont, uh, which is a subsidiary of Hermitage Chemical, uh, they were looking at northwestern Ohio to build a gas to methanol plant, and high-pressure natural gas was the key for them. So we found them a site right off of a high-pressure gas line that's feeding a, a gas-fired power plant, this was about a $62 million investment, 40 new jobs. We provided them a grant for site prep and engineering uh, construction costs, and then also a state tax credit. Uh, so it wasn't a huge dollar amount, but we found them the right site that is helping them serve their clients um, in the Midwest, basically from the Chicago area on east. And then we did work very closely with Ohio EPA because there were some really critical permitting pieces that um, – that were needed and the facility was up and running i think late last fall but here's just a couple of pictures and it's just outside of the toledo uh region 
And then very briefly, 2021 forecast, we're really hopeful that we can get PTT to an FID. It, it'll be eight years this July that we've been working with them. So very uh, long, a uh, lot of uh, resources we've put into that. We are ca cautious to the gas to liquids projects that we see. Uh, oftentimes they're being led by early stage or startup companies, which we have a hard time incentivizing, as I mentioned before. We are seeing more biodiesel projects with states and provinces in Canada passing low carbon fuel standards. We're seeing more of those types of projects uh, pop up and then more on the renewable side, especially solar to feed various industries throughout Ohio. So we are trying to have more of a balanced approach, uh, big focus still on petrochemicals, but also um, being more uh, accepting and, and supportive of renewable projects to help uh, companies throughout the state. So with that, I think I'll turn it over to Brent. Great, thanks, Matt. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Governor Tom Wolf and Dennis Davin, Secretary of the Department of Community and Economic Development, uh, I wanna thank Chris uh, and Scott and everyone uh, at his team uh, for inviting Pennsylvania to participate in this conference today. It's a pleasure to be all with you uh, and also uh, with my neighbors from Ohio and West Virginia. What I'd like to do, similar to what uh, Matt had shared, is give an overview of my office, the governor's action team, talk about some of our uh, chief uh, incentive programs specific for the uh, petrochemical industry uh, and some others, uh, and then wrap up uh, briefly with uh, an overview uh, of the uh, Shell project uh, in Beaver County. So uh, what my office does, the Governor's Action Team, we effectively serve as the uh, state's lead uh, economic development office, providing comprehensive economic development services, typically involving larger, uh, more complex projects, considering Pennsylvania for uh, expansion uh, or relocation. Uh, we're headquartered in the state capital uh, of Harrisburg. Uh, I have a team of uh, 17 professionals that provide uh, what we like to call concierge level services uh, to our clients, including location services, data, analytical research, uh, workforce investment uh, assessment, uh, training resources, and then packaging uh, customized incentives. We work directly under uh, the governor and the secretary of DCD. Uh, we also coordinate services and support through other state agencies on a priority basis, uh, including environmental permitting needs, transportation matters, including road, rail, uh, as, also, as well as labor uh, and tax assistance matters. Uh, we typically work directly with uh, corporate executives and their project teams, uh, incentive and location advisors, and uh, coordinate services with a vast network of our local economic development service providers across the Commonwealth uh, in response to RFPs. And uh, similar to Jobs Ohio, uh, we here in Pennsylvania also take uh, an ROI approach uh, to resources that we're able to uh, provide and leverage investment in our state. Quick map here, uh, most of our professionals are based in Harrisburg, but we do have regional offices located in uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, Northwest corner, Pittsburgh, uh, Pittston, which is in the northeast uh, part of the Commonwealth near Allentown, or excuse me, near Scranton and Wilkesbury, regional office in Allentown, which covers our Lehigh Valley area and also Philadelphia and Pennsylvania's southwest part of the state. By the numbers, uh, take a look at the past six years uh, of uh, Governor Wolf's administration. Um, I want to be clear that uh, this information is uh, based on activity uh, that my office uh, and projects that we had worked on uh, does not include uh, other programs or areas of DCD or even other agencies uh, where uh, incentives and business assistance resources are located. Uh, so over the last six years, uh, my team has worked on uh, just over uh, a thousand different projects. We made offers uh, to almost 400 uh, businesses, uh, completing about 357 of those uh, to date. Uh, those projects uh, ended up creating uh, over 38,000 new jobs, uh, work to retain 122,000 uh, jobs through additional investment uh, and workforce training resources that uh, we provided uh, to help them achieve those goals. And all in, uh, the work uh, that my folks had done attracted $14 billion uh, in new private investment. 
And uh, you can see uh, some of our clients uh, right there as well on this slide. So Pennsylvania uh, is located within a day's drive of uh, nearly 40% of the U.S. population and 60% of the Canadian population uh, in purchasing power, uh, including four of the 10 largest markets in the United States. Uh, this busy pin map showcases the location of nearly 1,000 uh, chemical and plastic businesses across the Commonwealth, uh, which take advantage of our location of raw materials, customers, business partners, and workforce talent. In addition to our business climate, market proximity, uh, and economic development services, uh, we have exceptional resources specifically supporting the, the plastics industry, which we're very proud to showcase. In Pennsylvania, we have two of only five accredited plastics engineering and technology programs in the nation. Penn College of Technology is located in the central part of the state in Williamsport, and Penn State Erie is located in the north northwest part of the Commonwealth. Two programs I'd like to cover briefly that are specific to uh, the petrochemical business. The first is our PA Resource Manufacturing Tax Credit. This was created uh, in the early days of the due diligence process uh, with Shell. Uh, the PRM uh, requires a $1 billion minimum capital investment. Uh, 2,500 full-time equivalent construction jobs must be demonstrated. And the tax credit uh, makes available uh, nickel per gallon or $2.10 uh, per barrel of ethane purchased and used in the manufacturing process at a facility in Pennsylvania. Uh, the credits are limited to 20% uh, of a uh, business's qualified PA tax liability each year. There uh, is a provision for sale uh, or assignment. Uh, the tax credit is not refundable, and it has a 25-year uh, shelf life. It did begin in 2017 and, and will sunset in 2042. Uh, came online more recently, uh, very similar to the PRM, our local resource manufacturing tax credit uh, was passed by our General Assembly and signed by Governor Wolf last July. Uh, it too provides a tax credit uh, to a manufacturer purchasing dry natural gas, methane of course, uh, for use uh, in manufacturing petrochemicals such as fertilizers uh, at a facility in a Commonwealth. Its minimum capital investment is 400 million. Uh, the project must demonstrate uh, creating at least 800 uh, full-time jobs during construction and the ongoing operation of the facility. This tax credit is equal to 47 cents uh, per unit of dry natural gas purchased and used in the manufacturing process of uh, chemicals or fertilizers. Uh, per unit is defined as 1,000 cubic feet. Very similar again to the PRM, uh, the use of the credit is limited to 20% of qualified PA tax liabilities. Uh, it is uh, uh, maxed out at just over $26 million per year made available for up to four projects. Uh, also like the PRM, uh, the local resource manufacturing tax credit has a provision for sale or assignment, uh, but it is not refundable. Another program I like to talk about is our Keystone Opportunity Zone program uh, that is not industry specific, but uh, is a very powerful incentive uh, that we've had in Pennsylvania for well over two decades. It's uh, straightforward, uh, very predictable, and zones are already designated. Uh, KOZ designations are typically granted to brownfield sites and uh, locations which are underutilized or distressed. Uh, the one thing I'd like to add here, uh, I think across the country, there's a lot of programs that uh, have a Z uh, somewhere in their language, but our Keystone Opportunity Zone program in Pennsylvania is not to be confused with the federal Qualified Opportunity Zone Initiative. Uh, there are many properties in Pennsylvania which uh, have both programs creating what could be uh, considered a potential super incentive site with compelling state and local tax avoidance uh, from our KOZ uh, as well as the potential to leverage investment uh, through funds that could benefit from tax savings on capital gains that are invested in a federal opportunities uh, zone. I'd like to talk briefly about uh, decommissioning and redevelopment playbooks uh, for coal-fired power plants. Uh, we have a number uh, of these facilities that have and continue to be retired throughout the Commonwealth. The primary purpose of the, of the playbook uh, is to provide a menu of, of redevelopment uh, plays for consideration by 
industrial site selectors and the development community as they seek new sites for investment. Uh, these sites feature very valuable brownfields with industrial infrastructure already in place. Uh, for the Commonwealth, these are priority redevelopment sites, um, and the stake has taken a very comprehensive approach uh, for finding best and greatest reuse of, of these former power plant sites and to proactively showcase uh, new opportunities to prospective investors. I would also like to mention uh, Pennsylvania uh, is a leader uh, in the nation as far as the number of international offices th that provide in-country representatives to work with foreign businesses, considering investment in the U.S. and Pennsylvania, uh, as well as export assistance uh, for Pennsylvania companies as well. Now I'd like to uh, briefly move into uh, the Shell uh, project uh, in uh, Southwest Pennsylvania, specifically in Beaver County. Um, the, the folks that we worked with at Shell, uh, when we started with them back in, in 2011, uh, invited us to participate on a journey with them uh, when they announced uh, plans to, uh, for an ethylene cracker plant in the Appalachian region, uh, end up uh, finally looking outside of Pittsburgh uh, at a location, uh, which you can see on the left, uh, was what the former Horsehead uh, zinc smeltering facility looked like back in, in 2014. Uh, at that time, Shell was conducting and just starting uh, its due diligence process uh, with those efforts that spanned over two administrations in Pennsylvania. Uh, there were certainly uh, numerous decision gates that had to be satisfied uh, before Shell made its final investment decision in uh, June of 2016. So nearly a, a five-year process from start to final investment decision and construction uh, certainly continues. In uh, the photo on the right, uh, you can take a look at that in uh, mid-2017, um, Shell announced completion of the site's uh, early works program, and that marked the beginning of the main construction phase. So why Pennsylvania and uh, this uh, site on the banks of the Ohio River? Uh, as we heard earlier, uh, talking about in Utica plays uh, in our region, uh, Shell made a market-driven uh, investment decision. Uh, the plant is located to both the source of the ethane and its customer base. More than 80% uh, of the North American polyethylene customers uh, are within 700-mile radius uh, of the area. Uh, and Shell's location in, in uh, Beaver County will provide uh, them a competitive advantage over Gulf Coast operators uh, by providing customers with a shorter uh, and more dependable supply chain for the region. Uh, and certainly our work uh, through that due diligence process uh, very much focused on the region's talent, both for construction services as well as ongoing plant operations. And I think uh, throughout the entire process, uh, we maintained a, a presence of an inviting uh, community uh, that demonstrated a true partnership uh, to work with Shell uh, on this process. By the numbers, uh, six billion, uh, give or take, in total investment. Uh, approximately 1,200 uh, acres were ultimately uh, assembled for this. And uh, once up and running, uh, Shell will be producing at the Beaver County facility uh, just over two, or excuse me, over three billion pounds uh, of plastics produced. Uniquely uh, and conveniently located uh, just about a half hour to downtown Pittsburgh and only 15 miles uh, from the international airport. Uh, so it's a very prime location sitting on the Ohio River. With this picture, uh, it was taking uh, just uh, just less than a uh, year ago. Uh, the project certainly uh, has been adjusted uh, in terms of the construction schedule by the uh, pandemic. Uh, talking with the folks at Shell uh, at the start and during the pandemic, uh, like all of us, they took the situation very seriously. Uh, had uh, the highest priority for life safety uh, and the health of their workers and took appropriate measures uh, to scale back and, and do what they needed to do to uh, address the situation and uh, restart uh, construction in, in a safe manner in accordance with uh, pandemic uh, guidance. Uh, again, we understand the project is probably better than 70% uh, percent complete right now. Uh, the operation startup question, uh, I think uh, we're allowed to say it's, it's coming soon, and uh, it's still slated to uh, come online in the early 2020s, uh, which we're certainly in right now. So we're very anxious 
uh, for the start switch to get flipped on and, and for this terrific project to start uh, producing plastic resin. And one last photo I'd like to share, I think it's appropriate on a cold winter day, is a, is a terrific uh, sunset photo uh, of where the location uh, is and the activity to date, uh, looking at the Ohio River going downstream, uh, looking west to our friends over in Ohio. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll be happy to answer questions following uh, West Virginia's presentation with James. So I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much, Brent. And Matt, it's a pleasure to be with you as well. And of course, we'd like to thank the team, uh, Scott and Chris at Voorhees for allowing us to be part of the VDIC presentation. Um, this is a great opportunity with Far Reach. And I want to say thank you on behalf of our Commerce Department A little bit about our team. Um, Governor Justice was reelected uh, this past fall. We'll serve another four year term. Uh, much of our leadership remains intact at the cabinet level. Uh, similar to, to Pennsylvania, we operate as a state agency. And so the Commerce Department is part of state government. Within that, we have, um, of course, an Office of Economic Development and teams within that that focus on business retention expansion. Uh, recruitment of FDI and export assistance, and then and the other piece is business attraction. So certainly this has been a, a unique time in human history, living through the pandemic, and certainly we would never make light of that. Uh, what I would tell you is we were very fortunate to have a banner year um, in 2020. The thing that stands out the most of the announcement of Hyperloop, uh, making the decision to place their certification center in Northern West Virginia, uh, that was a very competitive endeavor that involved a multi-agency approach um, and similar to the other two states you know we do try to provide that whole of government assistance as projects move forward but also in 2020 several companies based in the gulf coast placed investment in the kanawha valley of west virginia we're very pleased by that um, on top of that we had an expansion of clockner pinoplast in the southern part of the state uh, we saw west virginia methanol make their announcement and another headlining event for us was Clorox decision to place a manufacturing plant in the Eastern Panhandle. We'll talk a lot about uh, worker performance. You know, we, we all know what we have in the region. Uh, we have great muscle memory, a mix of blue collar and white collar talent that isn't necessarily found um, across the rest of the country. But I will say that um, anytime I'm in Pittsburgh, you know, the first person I see is from Weirton or Wheeling and certainly it's a tri-state labor shed, uh, at least in most of our state. Okay, we've talked a lot about this. Um, as Matt and Brent spoke, I won't dwell on this. We do think that our process is compelling because of the concierge level of service. Uh, like the other states, we make training available um, through any mechanism necessary. You know, Often it's the community technical college system. Sometimes it's the universities themselves. Um, we also believe that we offer um, a type of collaboration that isn't always seen throughout the rest of the country. Business climate speaks for itself. Um, West Virginia, dating back to 2015, has made ongoing efforts to improve both taxation uh, as well as tort and legal reform and other metrics that impact the operating of business. Um, we have cut income tax over the past five years. Uh, corporate, um, we've also seen reductions in sales tax and we continue to look at ways to be uh, more innovative at the handling of property tax. Again, on maps, um, you've seen many great images from my colleagues. I won't spend a lot of time on this other than to say, we sit atop, as, as Scott touched on, vast reserves of natural gas and natural gas liquids, uh, predominantly in the northern part of our state and the Ohio River corridor. Um, I would say, as you look at companies, many of the world's best companies operate, not just in West Virginia, but in some mix of the three states. You know, one example is Solve, which has a plant both in Marietta and Parkersburg. And then also, you know, you have a company like Cavestro who has investments in Pennsylvania as well as West Virginia. Okay, let's talk a little bit about business assistance. And, you know, I mentioned we're structured more like Pennsylvania being a branch of government, um, but we do try to look at best practice from Ohio as well and a lot of the things that are done by our peers. You know, when it comes to working with either a vetted prospect or a new lead, 
we really try to put um, everything at the disposal that would advance the discussion. So we help obviously with review sites, uh, identifying building options. We pull together the state's um, financing programs, as well as facilitate meetings with anyone in the transportation logistics space. Okay, and just to continue that a little bit, you know, part of that offering is the Governor's Guaranteed Workforce Program, which offers, uh, or sorry, operates as a training grant. Uh, we also offer in-kind assistance as companies screen talent on the way in, and then when they're expanding, when they, if they have to set up training programs with partner institutions. Um, we do have the ability to make roadway improvements, especially such that um, you know the company's investment would, uh, would come to pass. And then in terms of utilities, especially water and sewer, um, the state maintains an infrastructure council to facilitate that. Okay, talk a little bit about permitting with the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection. Um, certainly every state goes to great lengths to protect their environment. And I would say we have some wonderful efforts at stream restoration, uh, as well as youth-based programs. The, the team at DEP does a tremendous job. But on top of that, we've been a very industry-friendly uh, DEP. And we have an affinity for industry. And our attitude is, you know, how do we facilitate the project? So you'll find that we have a primacy. So standards in West Virginia typically never exceed those at the federal level. And then also when a, when a project's being worked, we provide a liaison. Uh, so that the company has someone on the permitting side to work directly with. One thing I would touch on, uh, this, this occurred last year in the fall. Um, we were designated to now meet um, ambient air quality standards under the um, NAAQS Act. And that's significant because that means that every county and part of West Virginia is now in attainment. And that speaks to, um, to air quality standards, but of course, ironically, makes new permitting a little bit easier. Financial assistance, uh, briefly touch on the State Economic Development Authority. Um, they do provide uh, direct asset lending, or I'm sorry, fixed, a fixed asset financing, and uh, at fairly modest levels as far as what we can provide, and they do use standard underwriting. Uh, but the EDA helps in other ways as well. Some companies will uh, set up an, an operating lease or synthetic lease, and the EDA will help facilitate that. And they also have the ability to issue industrial bonds. Getting into the tax part, I always offer the disclaimer, uh, I'm not an attorney, I'm also not an accountant, and I, I don't want to put the, um, the audience to sleep. So suffice it to say, uh, we have a very robust menu of tax credit programs that essentially provide offsets to income tax, sales tax, and property tax. And some of the slides will touch on that. Uh, I know folks may have questions and be happy to address any of those offline about specific programs. But before I move on, I will mention uh, several things in particular. Okay, at the bottom of the slide, you'll see something known as the 5 for 25 legislation. And of course, that was passed um, a number of years ago when Shell was starting to look at the Appalachian region. So 5 for 25 is um, essentially a property tax incentive for world scale investments. It is based upon NAICS code and requires capital investment of 2 billion or more. The 5 for 25 would assist any company that would locate a large hydrocarbons plant in West Virginia. But in its current usage, it is enjoyed by many of the midstream companies that have fractionation and other separation facilities for natural gas liquids. A couple of things are new on the horizon for us. In the 2020 legislative session, um, two new programs were passed, first being the downstream natural gas manufacturing investment tax credit. And this essentially is an offset against corporate income tax or pass-through income tax. And it's uh, very similar to our economic opportunity credit, which of course is based on both job creation and capital investment. The difference with this one obviously is that it, it must pertain to the natural gas or NGL industry. And the credit lasts um, up to 20 years, whereas the other one lasts 13 years. The second one is the Natural Gas Liquids Economic Development Act. And to be very candid with you, that was put into place to try to um, reinvigorate the discussion in West Virginia of a natural gas liquid storage hub. We very much want to um, entertain uh, companies that are looking at storage of NGLs. And of course, that's been a tri-state endeavor. And what the credit would do, um, you know, for a company that is transporting large volumes of NGL or creating permanent storage, uh, this would provide a income tax credit 
uh, working as an offset against any property tax paid. Okay, talk a little bit about some of the, um, the projects that have, have stood out over the years. And again, I'll try to be brief as, as I review this. Uh, several years ago, a Canadian company known as Vidal Gas Compression uh, made the decision to locate in Weirton, West Virginia. And this process moved very quickly. It was definitely an all hands on deck approach. Um, some of you may be familiar with the, the general site that was chosen. Um, the company ended up um, placing their operation in a machine shop that is part of the old Weirton steel footprint. So we, we were looking at a very large brownfield property that had already received significant remediation. The building itself um, had great bones to it. It did require some upgrades that were facilitated by the local economic development organization. And the state through our uh, EDA was able to provide um, financing to facilitate the final decision. And that investment um, was approximately 15 million in its initial iteration with about uh, 45 permanent hires. And just a really neat story because many of the workers came from um, Ohio and Pennsylvania with Weirton being a border city. Okay, SI Group, uh, most of you would know this is Adavant. This is in Morgantown and was previously a company called Kimtura. And the reason I lift this up, this pro project was uh, represented of course by um, Adavant officials at the corporate level, but also by a site selection consultant. So, you know, the way that we were able to administer health was very important for them to make a final decision. Um, it's a good day anytime we beat Texas for an investment. That was the case here. Uh, we also beat Connecticut who had, um, both of those states also had branches of the company. And Adavant specializes in um, food packaging and has several innovative products. And you wouldn't think necessarily that they would be in the, the University City of Morgantown, but they do operate along the, um, the Mon River and part of what they were looking for, in addition to um, upgrades to access road, uh, they were also looking for help with equipment, which was facilitated through several loans, and then also energy efficiency uh, devices, which actually the county commission stepped up in that case. Um, this one also moved quickly once the uh, project became known, and uh, we were, we were pr proud to get it closed. Okay, this represents um, a good one to, to close on, uh, although I do have one more slide after this. Uh, five years ago, going back five and a half, we were absolutely delighted to have Procter & Gamble, um, you know, one of the world's foremost consumer products company, announced in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. And you may see that and say, you know, I thought this was petrochemical presentation today. And, and I'll just say this, P&G, more than any of us realize, is a polymer and chemical company. You know, they work with a lot of surfactants, um, and other advanced polymers. You know, they make everything from dryer sheets uh, to shaving products. I won't go through the list, but their facility in Martinsburg was their first major uh, plant investment in nearly 40 years. And that also took a very comprehensive approach. We did have a site that was, um, for the most part, a greenfield property that was ready to go. Uh, we did make some water extensions to help facilitate their decision. Um, and then other things that helped Berkeley County uh, with a payment in lieu of arrangement to help handle the property tax issue. Um, also very proud of, of P&G and what they've done. Their training center is housed at the Blue Ridge Technical Center, which is actually in a different county. So what they've done is they've made a commitment, not just to Martinsburg, but to the whole panhandle um, and really to the region uh, as their workers come from a four state shed. So delighted by that project, it was um, 500 million CapEx in its initial iteration and it has grown much bigger since then. Okay, what comes next? Uh, what do we see as we, we look at the year ahead? We certainly wanna build on the success of 2020. Um, I would tell you with methanol plants, uh, this, this goes a little bit to what uh, Matt was saying earlier. You know, some of them are a bit blue sky in nature. So we have one that's under construction that is um, probably about 70% complete outside of Charleston. Uh, we look forward to them coming online. And then we also have one that announced uh, back in October. So we're also working with them diligently. You know, something that we think about often is um, the supply chain, and I'm sure that will come up in questions and remarks. We wanna look at our existing companies and say, okay, what do they need uh, to be more successful? And that's very intuitive, but sometimes you have to have those conversations. Uh, we've done that with um, 
you know, a number of companies in both the uh, petrochemical space as well as the aerospace industry. And the final thing I'll touch on off that list, you'll see where we mentioned existing chemical parks and the co-location model. And that's perhaps West Virginia's best chance at, at what I would call short, short-term success is having companies come in and, and a lot of the infrastructure is already in place and not just infrastructure, but the services, uh, whether that's safety, fire suppression, industrial gases. So I'm happy to share that map with anyone that's, that's interested um, after the fact. We have a number of chemical parks uh, really throughout the Kanawha River and Ohio River region that facilitate those types of medium-sized investments. So in, in wrapping up, I, I wanna thank Scott and Chris uh, and your whole team. It's a pleasure to be here and look forward to uh, adding value in any way I can. Thank you all. Great, thanks James. And thanks Brent and Matt, that was awesome. I uh, really appreciate that. So the hour is flying by, so let's just dive into some Q&A. Um, Matt, I'll start with you, um, and then we can let Brent and James you know, weigh in as well. So the Gulf Coast has historically been the main hub for petrochemicals in the country for many years. Um, describe you know, the ways in which this tri-state region may be more attractive uh, than the Gulf Coast uh, to the petrochemical downstream and, and, and use manufacturing companies and businesses. Yeah, it's a great question, Chris, and it's something we've talked a lot about um, with companies located in the Gulf, uh, as well as the partners in West Virginia and Pennsylvania. A couple things to come to mind. One is when you're looking at these chemicals, plastics, we are in the middle of the the U.S. demand. Uh, we talked, you, you showed your charts earlier, 80% of polyethylene, 70% percent of polypropylene is consumed in our region. And so when you combine that with the low cost feedstock, ethane, maybe propane or butane and other uses or natural gas, being able to locate on top of the really low cost feedstock and then ship it a, a much closer distance uh, makes it uh, rather advantageous to be up here. The fact that Shell's plant is nearing completion in Manaka really helps cement uh, our stake in the ground. Uh, if we talked to companies seven, eight years ago in the Gulf, they would just kind of pat us on our head and say, don't worry about us, send us your uh, NGLs and we'll take care of them. Uh, now the Shell project makes it a lot more real. And then you look at the natural disaster equation, and I know we've, we've talked in preparation of this conference and James has some good maps. We have a similar uh, Red Cross map that we share, uh, which is the the hurricanes and uh, other issues that the Gulf Coast has been hit with over the past few years. And I, I don't think I ever uh, characterize us as displacing or replacing the Gulf Coast, but being a very good uh, kind of second Petchem uh, hub so when those operations do have to shut down, um, you know, them having redundancy up here makes a lot of sense. And then uh, I think I circulated an email yesterday that due to the cold weather in Houston, the last couple of days, several chemical companies had to uh, announce force majeure uh, closings because of, of the ice. So now they're getting it on both ends, uh, summertime hurricanes and now uh, February ice. So um, really the reliability, uh, the access to market, the cheap feedstock uh, really puts us well positioned. So Brent, uh, so the the natural resources are here. We discussed it with, with the shales. Shales building the cracker, you know, PTT hopefully is next. Is the goal now to recruit businesses that would have otherwise located on the Gulf Coast to this region? And, and if so, what, you know, what steps or what strategies are being implemented to, to attract the, excuse me, to attract those companies? Sure. Thanks, Chris. And I think part of, of the answer to that question uh, is also based on uh, what Matt had shared. Uh, you, you know, certainly at the start of, of the, 
uh, exploration by Shell uh, in the Appalachian region. Uh, other entities in the Gulf Coast were just uh, taking a step back and, and looking at that, not really sure if uh, an opportunity like this with an investment of this magnitude uh, would actually come to fruition. Uh, and, it, and it has, it is, uh, for the first time in over uh, two decades outside of the U.S. Gulf Coast. Uh, so for uh, the, the reasons that Matt had shared as well, um, it has always been our position in Pennsylvania uh, that uh, you know we're not going to be just satisfied with the Shell project, but it but it's part of a total solution to an opportunity in raising uh, an entire industry, not only in Pennsylvania but uh, the entire Shell formation uh, involving our, our neighbors in Ohio and West Virginia as well. And I think one of the key uh, items to to uh, showcase and certainly. Shell knows this, is, is that transportation factor. So after you take care of your fixed costs, what variable costs can you get your arms wrapped around? Uh, and then when you talk about selling resin uh, competitively uh, with fractions of a penny per pound making a difference, combined with taking the feedstock right out from underneath your feet, processing it for value added, and then sending it uh, maybe just down the street, perhaps, uh, to a, um, uh, a customer to make a, a product out of it. Uh, that has been part of our goal all along. So it's just not the Shell project and, and maybe three or four more uh, ethane crackers uh, are available to come online in a region through the, um, as per the IHS market report. But we also, with as much vigor and emphasis uh, to help our existing uh, Pennsylvania companies, particularly those that uh, are going to need more plastic resin that would be produced from Shell to make products. Uh, again, whether it's construction material, consumer products and packaging, such as uh, what James had mentioned out of P&G uh, and other items, that very much is part of our portfolio for economic growth, uh, is helping the manuf downstream manufacturing uh, opportunities invest uh, for the very same and similar reasons as why Shell made the investment here, market proximity, consumer base. Okay, great. Hey, James, uh, you know, shifting gears a little from you know from that attraction from the Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast we were talking about. Do you have a sense for how the low natural gas prices and you know, the struggles of many in the energy industry will impact? You know, the business development efforts for this right now? Sure, that's that's a great question. And and we empathize with producers. You know, any low price low price environment is um, difficult for them to withstand. But I would say this low prices are a clarifying uh, kind of dynamic. And what we've seen, at least from our perspective, is some consolidation um, in the upstream industry, which we would hope would lead to uh, several types of efficiencies. And the other thing that um, low prices may help, you know, the, the companies have an incentive now more than ever to talk with us about downstream users of their product. So what we've seen over the past four to five months, you know, a lot more of the producer companies are um, calling us and setting meetings and saying, okay, we've seen the methanol announcements. You know, we'd love to be a, a part of, of supporting that. And we'd also like to, to recruit more downstream users. So again, I think the, the consolidation, um, it may be painful in real time, but I think the long-term effects are going to be helpful. Uh, we also hope that it leads to some infrastructure build out that hadn't previously happened uh, as far as either gathering locations or um, lateral pipe that connects different parts of the state to each other. Great. So Matt, we are, you know, we have about a minute left. Um, so I'll give you a quick one. <laughs> Um, so has the pandemic revealed anything in particular about the pet cam industry or downstream businesses that has, has surprised you or, or you know, made you think otherwise prior to the, than, you were, than you were feeling prior to the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, within about 50 seconds, uh, I think it's opened a lot of people's eyes the role that petrochemicals play in PPE, uh, medical devices, pharmaceuticals themselves, and uh, combine that with uh, realizing the long supply chains, um, supply chains throughout the world, and uh, understanding uh, or getting a sense of how much we want to shorten those supply chains and have 
things, more things made uh, in the U.S. Jobs Ohio is really focused on trying to understand opportunities related to shortening supply chains. And when you look at it, uh, petrochemicals, I, I think, is the crux of, of many things. And uh, while there are some detractors of the industry and plastics, um, I bet uh, 40 million people in the U.S. wouldn't have gotten vaccinated over the last two months without petrochemicals, whether it's through syringes or the vials that the vaccines are in or the shipping uh, uh, containers that are used for the for the cold storage. So um, it's been eye opening and I think there are more opportunities for us to capitalize on. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, so that is all we have time for today. I wish we could have gotten more of a question, but um, if you do have any for the audience members, if you do have questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, thank you to everyone uh, that took the time to tune in today. We greatly appreciate it and uh, have a great day.